<laughs> All right, we've started the recording. It's Tuesday night at 5.01 because we had to listen to the end of the song, of course. I am going to enable our transcription. But good evening, everyone, and welcome to our final workshop in our spring Grow Your Own High Elevation Gardening in the Sierra Nevada series. My name is Ann Graham, and I'm with the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center. Tonight, we have a special presentation. It's a new presentation to our workshop series on herbs uh, with our Organic Gardening 101 presenter, Heather Adams. We're so excited to have Heather back. She's so knowledgeable and um, is actually starting her own uh, soil consultation business that she, I imagine, will elaborate a little bit better on than I can speak to. But she's a super awesome and super knowledgeable presenter, so we're very lucky to have her here presenting this evening on herbs. Like I said, this is our last workshop in our series uh, this spring, but you can rewatch all of our workshops that we've had in our series on the Slow Food Lake Tahoe website. And I'll have the link for that to rewatch any of our previous presentations uh, at the end of our presentation. Just to go through our quick Zoom things in case we have any new participants who haven't joined us in past weeks. Throughout the Zoom presentation, I will be spotlighting different people I'm actually going to spotlight myself right now, um, just so that our recording only records me and not other uh, participants in our Zoom workshop. But in case I forget to spotlight anyone and you only wanna see our presenter in that upper right-hand corner, you can click view and speaker only. Or if you wanna watch anyone else that's participating in our garden workshop, you can watch it in gallery mode, but I imagine that might not be quite as informative. And then we'll have a question and answer session with Heather at the end of our workshop series uh, this evening. So at the bottom of our screen, we have a chat dialog box that if you click on it, it will open up uh, this dialog box rather that allows you to type in any questions you may have. And I will be compiling those questions for Heather to answer at the end of her presentation. So make sure where it says to, um, you just type or click and make sure that those are going to Ann Graham. Uh, so I can compile those. Some of you may be seeing subtitles at the bottom of your screen. Zoom is doing an awesome job of making uh, the platform more accessible. If you want to view those subtitles and currently don't see them, or if you would like to turn them off, or if you would like to view a pop-out transcription of our entire workshop on the bottom screen, similar place where you find chat, you will see an option that says live transcript. Clicking the up arrow, you'll see either hide subtitles or view subtitles or view full transcript by which you can then see that dialog box open on the side. So those are our quick Zoom lessons, but we're gonna turn it over to Heather now so she can start teaching us all about herbs. So I'll stop my screen share and get you spotlighted. Great, thank you so much, Anne. Anne is so great, without her, none of this would go because she's just so talented at making all of the technology go. Um, well, thank you so much for coming. I hope that you have a glass of wine and we're going to have some fun talking about herbs. I love herbs. They're so awesome. It's like one of my favorite things to grow in Tahoe. You can actually grow it and harvest it and use it like rather than working all summer for like three tomatoes. So it's one of my favorite things to grow. I've been growing herbs for a very long time and I've been preserving them and using them and doing all sorts of fun things with them since I can remember. Um, my first big herb garden that I created was in college with a few of my college girlfriends. We actually created an herb garden on campus, the first one through our like little herb club. And I've just been addicted ever since. And I've been growing them for many decades now. So I'm excited to share with you some of the stuff that I know. Um, and I'm really excited about this presentation. I've made it really simple and easy because we're, I'm doing four herbs and there isn't a whole lot of time to spend. So I just tried to make it as easy and digestible and as fun as possible so you can have um, little effort with a lot of takeaway. So I'm going to start with sharing my screen here. And start with present. So here we are, the last of the Growing Food in Tahoe workshops. We are in partnership with the UC Master Gardeners, um, the UC Davis Tahoe Research um, Center, TURC, which is Anne is part of the um, Chalak Heritage Gardens and Slow Food Lake Tahoe. 
Um, as for me, I'm Heather Adams. I have I helped create the Slow Food Lake Tahoe Garden in Truckee, uh, which has a huge herb garden. Um, I also run my own business, which is called Tahoe Integrated Landscape Consulting, where I do soil testing and, and consulting on everyone's kind of yards. I'm the bridge between DIY and paying a really expensive landscaper. I help with design and picking out plants and kind of you can hire me as a consult and kind of help be like coach you along the process. So rather than spending tens of thousands of dollars, you can kind of be pointed in the right direction to doing it yourself. And my whole concept is that we use these things and incorporate them in our yard and get integrated into our landscape and our environment to benefit both ourselves and Tahoe. So it's an awesome organization and I'm super proud to have started it. So let's get to it, growing herbs in Tahoe. So number one, um, herbs, according to Merriam-Webster, are defined as seed producing annual, biannual or perennial, that does not develop persistent woody tissue. So essentially it dies back every year. That's the definition of an herb. And like a lot of our flowers and stuff can actually be defined as herbs as, as well. And the number one thing that if you take away anything at all, Herbs love to be cut. This is the number one thing that I think most people really um, do wrong because you know you, you're trying to grow these beautiful little plants and you love them so much and you don't want them, you don't want to use them, but they love to be used. They love to be harvested. They love to be cut. The more you cut them, the more you harvest them, the bigger they get. Um, this picture on the right is actually my herb harvest from my own garden last fall. Um, and in my yard, so you can see that there's tons of wild sage in there, as well as yarrow, mint, thyme, loads of thyme, lavender, rosemary, lots and lots of stuff. So that's just kind of, that was one of my bigger herb harvest in the fall last year. So you can do it. We can all grow herbs here, <laughs> which is fantastic. So this is like super, 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 super general. Like if you are, if you have an herb and you're not sure, like these are kind of kind of help guide you into them doing well. Each herb has its own characteristics that it loves and specific conditions, but these ones are the super, super general, like I'm not sure, like what do I do? Most of them like full sun that's self-facing. So, you know, most of them, not all of them, but a lot of them really like a lot of sun. So make sure you put them in a sunny spot. Most of them like ordinary organic potting soil with drainage holes. So just kind of, you know, a little pot and just make sure there's a hole in the bottom. If you're planting your herbs in like a mug or something that doesn't have a drainage hole in the bottom, it's not going to be happy. Herbs do not like to be waterlogged. So make sure that it has a drainage hole. And, you know, I grow most of my herbs in pots here in Tahoe because the conditions do change so much and it's really easy to move them around. And some of them are very invasive. So it's easy to keep them contained and kind of put them wherever. And there are spots in the garden. Of course, you want them to take over. Like if you have a spot in the back that you can't grow anything but mint, put mint there. You know, so there's all kinds of fun stuff you can do with them. The water finger test is essentially what I use with all my plants. Like you just stick your finger in it. Is it wet? Does your finger get wet when you stick it in your plant? If it does, then it probably doesn't need water. If it's really dry and like you stick it down even a little bit more and you still don't feel it, that means it's dried out and it needs water. So, I mean, my finger is protect, like always has dirt on it. Like next thing I know, I'm like brushing my teeth and I'm like sticking my plant, my finger in some plant. It's just like way the way I do it. And that's kind of like the number one easy way. And there's like meters and stuff you can get, but like a good old like touch to see if it needs water is probably like the best. And then the other rule when we're trimming our plants, because as we know, the big takeaway here already is make sure your plants are trimmed. Um, keep one third of your plant. And this is like kind of true for all plants, bushes, whatever. As long as there's one third of the plant left when you go to harvest it, it'll keep growing and it'll be happy. Um, during like full harvest in the fall, I cut it back a little bit more than that because I know it's not going to grow anymore. And I'm trying to like get as much as I can before winter. But the general rule is keep a third of the plant and it'll grow back and it'll get bushy and it'll be pretty. So these are like the super, super general. And here is our first herb, oregano. So oregano is in the Lamaaceae family, which is the mint family. And a lot of our herbs are in the mint family. And as you know, mint is kind of that one that we always think of that's kind of like that really aggressive plant. 
And here's like case in point. So like behind me, this is my hydroponic garden that I grow in my living room. This mint plant is literally, I'm gonna pull it out just so you can see how big it is. Look at this thing. It is just taking over and it's like thinking it can find a runner. Like this thing is crazy. So mint lamacea and like, so they're essentially, there's so many things in the mint family, but you know, if something is in the mint family, like actual mint is the most aggressive, but you kind of know that it wants to spread a lot and it wants to grow very vigorously. And oregano is definitely in that category. And what we are getting for your plants, which I need to plug the plants. So there's that we, we grow, the Desert Research Institute grows all these amazing plants for us. And the varieties that we pick out are specific for us in Tahoe. And it's really important that we, we get these plants because they want to know what grows well up here. Because we're trying to develop this whole um, idea that we can kind of mitigate what plants work well and what plants don't. So if you buy the plants from us, that helps us learn, learn which ones do well and which ones don't. And we can keep growing the ones that do so we can keep kind of cultivating certain varieties that do well at elevation. Okay, with that, we have Greek oregano, which is the same as this guy right here. So you can kind of see him. I, I have two cameras set up. I have the one that's kind of facing and then there's one that says Heather's iPhone and that's kind of my little presentation area. But here is our friend Greek oregano and he likes well-drained soil and he likes full sun and he drinks tons of water, especially when it gets hot in the summer. Like he's might even drink more than his neighbors. <laughs> like, so you gotta kind of be on top of how much water he's getting. And most of the time in Tahoe, he is considered an annual. So like, don't be sad if your oregano comes back and rejoice when it does, because sometimes it does. And you're stoked and like, I've, there's super old oregano plants in some Tahoe gardens. And then there's some places I've planted it year after year after year and it just like doesn't grow back. So don't beat yourself up if it doesn't come back because technically it's not really supposed to. Um, another kind of characteristic which kind of throws people off is that oregano sometimes really dies back in the heat of summer. So like it's growing great, it's growing great this time of year, it's boom, 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 boom. And then sometime in like the second week of August, it looks like it's dead. It's just because that's just kind of its growth pattern. It kind of blooms and then it kind of comes back in and then it'll kind of, you cut it back and then it'll bloom back up again. And if it does die back, it probably means it needs some harvesting. Um, it really doesn't like to be, oops, sorry. It doesn't like to be over fertilized. So that's kind of, really characteristic for a lot of our herbs is like they really don't want to be over fertilized so that's great less work for you and just make sure that they're in really good well-drained soil and harvest it often and i'll say that a lot more times <laughs> so some of its benefits and uses it's beautiful as an ornamental um oregano just grows so abundantly you let it go to flower put it in bouquets the bees love it um, it gives off this beautiful floral scent. It's also a natural pest repellent. So if you pick a bouquet of it and like put it out on the table, like when friends are coming over for a barbecue, maybe it might help keep the mosquitoes away. You know, I'll try anything. It's a great companion plant and really likes tomatoes. And, you know, it, because of its pest repellent properties, like if you plant it next to anything, it's really going to help kind of keep the pests away from those plants. But the reverse side of that is it tends to be a little bit aggressive in its growth patterns. So you want to be like play the balance of that. It's also a great antimicrobial. It's an anti-inflammatory. It helps respiratory health. Like I said, the bees, and it's used extensively in Italian cooking. I mean, here is, I have a couple of different oreganos here from different harvests. Um, and, you know, it's really great if you can store your dried herbs in a, um, in, in a kind of a, a non glass container, like something that keeps the light out because your herbs actually last a lot longer if they don't, aren't subjected to sunlight, like in a cabinet, in a, in a light proof container, whatever, but you know, it's also really pretty. So it's nice to kind of have it out. Um, and that's one of the things that I love about being able to grow my own herbs. Like I don't buy this stuff in the store. I grow it, I dry it and, you know, I'll throw away the stuff that from last year, put the new stuff in, in the fall when it's ready, you know, and I do that with pretty much all of my culinary herbs and I always have enough for all winter long. And then they're always fresh and delicious and they're practically free um, after you get to use them for a while. 
All right, on to Parsley. So like I said, I'm just trying to kind of get through this because I have some really fun demos to show and gonna give you the basic information. So Parsley is in the APACA family, which is the carrot and celery family. So it's a lot different than um, the, a lot of the other herbs that we're going to talk about. Um, it's, it's really, there's a two main types and it's flat leaf parsley and curly leaf parsley. We've gotten you guys some flat leaf parsley and it's this big um, green leaf kind that's from Italy. It's supposed to be really packed with flavor and it's supposed to do really well at, at elevation. Parsley has been cultivated for over 2000 years. It's a really, really old herb and we've been using it for a long time. It's Mediterranean in origin. So uh, I always try and really keep where the plant came from in mind on like oregano is from the Mediterranean as well is because that's really going to help you to figure out what it needs to survive. Like, why is it happy? Like, why is it not happy? What's happening here? Um, so <clears throat> the number one thing that parsley is kind of the opposite as the rest of the herbs is it really likes cold weather. So my parsley always does fantastic in the spring and fantastic in the fall, but sometimes I really struggle with it midsummer because it really doesn't like the heat. It really likes to be cold. It's kind of okay with some freezing nights and it really likes to be cut all the time. And I have some examples. I'm really excited to show you guys when we go into the demo about some parsley plants that I have in some different stages. <clears throat> Oops, there we go. <laughs> the growing conditions, like I said, it likes low light, cooler temperatures. It likes a, um, I'm gonna move you guys. It likes a lot of water. Um, most of our, most of our plants really like cold, like, like a lot of water, right? They don't want to dry out. You know, you can kind of let them dry out in between waterings, but they don't want to be dry for too long because suddenly all of their processes that they need to survive are put on hold and it's struggling and we want to try and make them thrive. So let's give them enough water, which is hard right now because it's arid, but we got to stay on top of our herbs. Another great reason to do it in pots because then you can water it by hand. You can move them around. Like parsley might need to be like in a sunnier spot in, in the early spring where when it's really cold, but then once the hot intense um, summer sun comes, he needs to go to a shadier place. So we definitely wanna keep your parsley out of the hot sun. And if it does get a lot of sun, you know, try and keep it in the shade in the afternoon. Like I said, it likes to grow in the spring and fall and it loves to be cut just like the rest of our herbs. Parsley uses and benefits, it loves tomatoes. So parsley and tomatoes are just like a really great match made in heaven and they taste great together. They grow great together. They're really happy. And like, if you can kind of grow your parsley in the shade of your tomato plants, it's gonna be even happier. It attracts butterflies when it blooms. Um, it's super high in vitamin C. One of the first things I always do when I go out and when I'm sick is I buy like a big bunch of parsley and I put it in all my food that I'm eating because it has more, so it's more so than citrus. Like you can get more vitamin C out of sprinkling some parsley in your soup than you can from like eating a bunch of oranges. Um, so it's really great um, with its antioxidant, anti-inflammatory properties. It's such a great herb and um, it's a great addition to a wide variety of dishes and it grows in such abundance. I always love garnishing it with like any dips or soups or anything. Like I just always, I put it in everything, salads, you know, you can't really go wrong. It's just going to boost that freshness. It's going to boost like all these great properties. Like there's a reason why it's kind of the universal garnish because <laughs> it's awesome. Basil, on to basil. So the variety that we're giving you guys is a nefer basil and it's, um, it's got really broad, dark green leaves and it grows, it should grow well in our climate. And it, it gives off a lot of aroma. It's like a very potent variety of basil. Um, and there's loads of different kinds of basil. There's holy basil, which is like more of like a medicinal herb. And then there's like Thai basil, there's bush basil. Like I've had a lot of luck growing bush basil. Um, and, and they're just like really tiny, like little bushy little ones. And there's so many different kinds. And again, we are in our Lamaceae family. So basil's basil's in hanging out with mint it's it's in the mint family so it has a similar structure when it blooms as the rest of them so i really want to talk a little bit about basil history because i think it's hilarious um because it's so much different than 
anything else that's out there. Um, you know, it's so variety and this just kind of really goes to speak to how different and how crazy people are like all over the world. In ancient Greece, is basil was associated with hate. So if you were in ancient Greece, you gave your enemy basil. But in Egypt, basil was using, used in embalming and it was associated with death. So people didn't really go near basil because it was like, uh, no, that's the dead people herb. But then in Portugal, it was associated with love. So you gave like somebody you were in love with or like a parent or a family, if you wanted to express your love, you gave them basil. And pagans to this day associate basil with luck and money and use it in all kinds of different stuff. So I think it's so interesting that this one plant with so many different great properties like across the spectrum has this insane history. Like I just kept diving deeper and deeper when I was researching this and I just couldn't believe it. It's so crazy. So let's talk a little bit about growing conditions because basil, I think, is probably the number one thing that I get asked about a lot because people are like, oh, my basil isn't doing well. Okay. Basil is believed to originate from tropical India, which you can see on this map, like the green bits are kind of the tropical wet evergreen areas of India where basil is thought to have originated from. And it's pretty widely accepted that basil is thought to be a tropical plant in its origin. So we're trying to grow a tropical plant. So whenever we're kind of worried about the basil, it's like, okay, like let's try and make it like the tropics. And it's so finicky. It likes moist, well-drained soil and full sun. And by moist, I mean, do not let your basil go dry. My basil, when I let it go dry, its leaves just go, and you can tell like the second it goes dry, it gets really upset. And then it takes a few moments for it to recover. So really keeping on top of making sure that it's watered, but not overwatered is super important. Um, it loves humidity because of that tropical origin. So like if you have a way to kind of increase the humidity around your basil, it's going to be happier. And I'm going to show you one of my tricks for increasing humidity for my plants um, when I do the little demo. Um, basil does not tolerate cold. If it's, if your basil's outside right now, it's below 50 degrees at night. That's probably why it's angry. So it wants to be above 50 degrees, but then on the flip side of that, it doesn't like to be over 86 degrees in the hot sun. It's leaves can get scorched. This leaves are so tender that if it's in, the, it likes to be in the full sun, but if it's too hot, like it can't handle it in the, and it's evaporative system doesn't work fast enough. So it, they tend to get scorched. So if you're like, oh, why basil isn't doing well? It's because it's finicky. It's very, very finicky. And my best results for basil is growing it in my kitchen window because the, it doesn't vary as much. Like I've, I've had a lot of bad luck trying to grow basil outside. Every once in a while, it'll happen and it'll be a great summer. And my, in the basil I'm growing outside will be amazing. But then all of a sudden something, one of these factors will be off and my basil is unhappy. <laughs> and the other thing that might be affecting your basil is if it doesn't like the wind. So if it's out in a windy part of the garden, it's probably kind of getting angry and it wants to be protected. And it also really, the best time for basil is before it flowers. And so you really want to try and prevent your basil from flowering by pinching anything back that might look like a flower. But the key is, is to really keep harvesting your basil before it flowers so it stays in that vegetative state. Because that's, and this is pretty universal for all herbs, the most potent they are is before they flower. That's like when the most essential oils and and goodness is really in the leaves of the plant. And that's really the best time to harvest it is before the flower. It's not that it's bad after the flower and you can eat all the flowers and they're super pretty, but you know, if you're trying to get the essence from the actual herb, try and harvest as much as you can before it flowers. So basil takeaway, it's finicky, <laughs> but you know, it's so great because you, you can use it for so many things. I mean, I keep basil year round in my kitchen for pesto, caprese, pasta, salad, regular salad, pizza, seafood. I mean, it goes great with pretty much everything. It's so widely used in so many dishes. It's so amazing and it's so delicious and it's got great antioxidant properties, antimicrobial properties, anti-inflammatory properties. It's so fantastic. All right, let's have a sip of wine because I'm starting to get a little talk down here. I'm trying to fit this all in. 
because I got some really fun plants to show you guys. I've saved my absolute favorite for last, and that is thyme. And the variety that we are giving you is German winter thyme. And the picture on the left is actually my thyme that I took this picture a couple days ago. And it's actually this plant that's right beside me. I had to bring her in because she's one of my favorites and she brings me great joy. She is also in the Lamaceae family. So another mint, how great is that? Um, and thyme, I can't tell you how much I love this plant because in Tahoe, it does so great. And there's so many different kinds. There's lemon thyme, creeping thyme, dwarf thyme, French thyme, English thyme, wolfy thyme, elfin thyme. It's, and it's just, I, I grow probably five different varieties in my garden. This picture on the left is some woolly thyme that I grew in a container last year and this is it on bloom and the bees were just all over it it was you know woolly thyme is so great and the landscape is a ground cover um i use it quite a bit laying in between stones you can step on it um it's a great kind of lawn substitute and it's really once you get it established it needs very little soil and it's so happy <laughs> and it produces these great clusters of flowers that bees love and there's just so many different varieties and the best part about it is that it's a perennial in Tahoe. Thyme likes full sun and it prefers well-drained soil. Um, and it does not like overly humid conditions. That's one of the reasons it does so well here is that it it's, it's really likes it kind of drier. So it really thrives in our climate. Um, and it doesn't like to be over fertilized because if you've grown, if you've had a thyme plant for many, you know, a few years, it'll start to get really woody. And this is kind of a natural process. So you're kind of constantly trying to battle that woodiness to keep the herbaceous growth going. And so I'm really aggressive when it comes to cutting back the woody material of my thyme plants. And they always come back so vibrant and so beautiful. Um, you want to, so you want to make sure that you're on top of that trimming often to maintain this green, bushy and full um, growing habit. Um, it really likes to be deeply watered when it can, and it's totally okay with being dried out between waterings, totally opposite of our friend basil. So if you're kind of considering taking these herbs that we're giving you and putting them in one pot, you can totally do that. I've done loads of different herb pots, but just be aware that pretty much all of these guys need like just a little different growing conditions. So some stuff is going to flourish and some stuff is going to struggle if you throw it all into one spot together. Um, I'm just time this look at this beautiful variegated variety they're just so pretty and they're so happy and i just love how they fill in everything it's just one of my favorite plants <laughs> so time to have some fun <laughs> um time's favorite companion plants believe it or not are tomato and cabbage um i've grown it with tomatoes i mean i've grown time with so many different things and it just accents everything and makes it happy and i like hardly ever have any problems with bugs when i enter plant with time and it doesn't hog too much. It's such a friendly, lovely little plant. Um, and you can just kind of harvest it as you need it. And again, it's just, it thrives when it's pruned. So like the more you prune it, the bushier it's gonna get, the more you're gonna have. It's fantastic. So some of its uses and benefits, I use it quite often in meat, fish, and poultry dishes. Um, I also use it in a lot of marinades. I use it to season dressing. I use it to season soups. It pairs really well with lemon and garlic. Sometimes I'll kind of cook it in with some butter to make like an herb butter to like dip artichokes in or, you know, lobster if I'm so lucky <laughs> or crab or something. Um, and you want to add thyme early because it's kind of, it, it takes a li little bit for the essential oils and the thyme to really seep into the food. So it's way better to kind of add it like at the beginning of the cooking process rather than at the end, because you're not gonna get as much flavor from it because it takes a little bit of heat to release those essential oils in the time. It's great for respiratory health, it aids in digestion, especially fatty foods. So that's like one of the reasons it pairs so well with meats because it really helps you digest some of those fatty foods. Um, it's aromatherapy can, um, help, time can help you with improving your mood and enhance your well being. A tincture of it is known to help acne. Um, tincture is like a whole other workshop in its own right, but I can, I can attest to it, uh, aiding in mood and mood because like this guy, I like, I like literally go outside into the garden and just touch the sky every day and it brings me great joy. <laughs> 
All right, well, let's look at some of these plants and I'm gonna show you how to prune some of them. And I'm gonna kind of give you a few tips and tricks for different stuff that I use um, just in general maintenance of herbs. So I've got a whole bunch of fun stuff um, just kind of over here. If we wanna make sure that you see, everybody see the spotlight that. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Oh, sorry. Stop share, there we go. <laughs> all right, now we can see this. So I've got all kinds of fun stuff kind of propped up right here. Um, the first thing I wanna show you is uh, my humidity trick. So a lot of our plants that we grow inside and out require some extra humidity. So right here, I just have some random stones. Like these are just like some crystals that I got from like a shop like on sale, but like you can literally use like any kind of pebbles that you want. And the dish, ooh, that's loud. Sounds kind of fun though. You just fill a dish like that with stones. And then you add some water. <laughs> and essentially you have a little evaporative pool right here. And say you wanted your basil to kind of have a little bit more and you kind of want it to be wider. Like this one could probably use a little bit of a wider um, dish, but you get the idea. Essentially the water will evaporate around the plant and increase the overall humidity um, for the plant, um, just like in its own little localized area. So that's kind of like a way to just simply add humidity per one plant, um, which our friend Basil really likes humidity. And the other thing you can do is put on a humidifier or a diffuser. Like I have a big old humidifier, right? Huh? If you can look at my photo of myself, this little humidifier just lives right next to my hydroponic garden and I have it going all the time. So that helps add moisture to my house. So here is our little friend oregano. So this is the only plant that I have that only has um, one. I have multiple plants of the other ones. So I just kind of want to give you a quick little demo on how to prune these guys. So whenever you're looking at your plant like this, like I just bought this guy at the Safeway, right? And he's kind of leggy, you know, he's been sitting in a grocery store for a little while. Like you kind of want to make sure that there isn't any bugs on here. So you're not like bringing pests into the house and you want to kind of give it a once over. And when you're choosing plants at the grocery store, you want to try and make sure, or like anywhere really, you know, make sure that there isn't any yellowing leaves, you know, that it's got like a lot of fresh new growth on it and it looks happy. Um, I'm gonna show you some unhappy plants and those ones are the ones you don't choose. So essentially what's a little bit of plant anatomy. These little guys right here at the bottom, the very base of the stem, these are called the basal leaves. And these are the guys that are really kind of holding and anchoring and grounding the plant into themselves. We don't really wanna to mess too much with the basal leaves unless like they're really dying back or something like the basil leaves are kind of like where the plant starts. So you want to count up at least three notches of leaves. So one, let's see if you can see this. One, two, get out of the way. <laughs> one, two, three. So anywhere above there is fair game as far as harvesting is concerned. And if you look at it, that's kind of two thirds and that's kind of one third. So if you kind of use that rule of thirds and especially this three notch rule, so there's like the basil leaf and then one, and then one, one, two, three, anything above there is fair game. And when you go to trim this guy, like I don't think I wanna go, I think I'm gonna leave him here cause you can kind of see on this guy, he's got two like little babies right here coming out of the little notch and he's just gonna keep growing and being bushier. Um, so I'm gonna take, give him a little trim right there. And boom, there's a little sprig of oregano. And then these two guys are gonna branch out. And you can kind of tell, there were some other branches. You can kind of tell 
where the more of them are going to happen. So you, you want to get in there and allow that natural place where it's going to continue to kind of branch. You know, you want to kind of trim it wherever those branches kind of intersect because it's just going to continue to grow those stems and those branches. If that makes sense. Let's see here. I'm going to count this one. One, two, three. Okay, so everything above there is fair game. Boom. Boom. There's a couple more here. So you can kind of see, see where it's like branching. Give those guys a fighting chance. All right, there we go. So like, that's about a third, I think maybe this of the plant that's left. And I've maybe taken two thirds, maybe a little bit half, but it doesn't have to be perfect. But that's, that's how you kind of go about harvesting these guys. And then I want to show you essentially like, what do you do with it now? Like you can use this, go do some fresh cooking, add some, you know, some marinades, go make some pasta sauce, whatever you need. But say you want to dry this out and you want to use this kind of a little bit later on. It's so easy to do. So you just like kind of create a little bunch like that. You take some regular old kitchen twine and ba boom ba boom and you just tie these guys up easy peasy you know if they cooperate hopefully they do you know it's as simple as this <laughs> and then you hang the sky up in a dark, cool, dry or dark, dry place. So essentially, herbs dry the best in the dark. Like they, if the more sun that they get, the more likely they are to kind of not retain as many of its essential oils and 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 medicinal benefits. So you kind of want to find a cool, dry non -lit litted spot. Like I just kind of do it in the corner of my kitchen, kind of behind there. There's like a corner by the refrigerator. That's really dark. I have a string hook um, up there and I just hang them up like that. And when it's dry, like this is some mint that I dried, you know, this probably been in my kitchen for maybe about a month. So this guy is ready to process and ready to go into the peppermint jar, which Oh no, kitty's down. Okay, saved him. Um, here is my peppermint jar. Um, so you can see like, you don't have to like do anything crazy technical and look at how pretty this is. I just spray painted the lid. Um, it's a pickle jar with a copper spray painted lid. You just wanna air it out real well and kind of make sure that it doesn't have the spray paint smell. So like, and then I just write peppermint on the jar and I put a little piece of burlap on it and it's so pretty and I love the way it looks in my cabinet and it smells so great. And essentially like you can do it as simple as just kind of scrunching it in and like letting it go in there, boom. Or, you know, you can kind of process it a little bit more and put it in like a little herb grinder or like through a sieve, but, um, you know, sometimes I like to just keep it easy and you can use this in teas and I use peppermint a lot. I make my own like cleaning solutions. So I use that a lot in cleaning solutions and all kinds of fun stuff. So peppermint, there we go. All right, let's look at some other plants now that you know how to dry them and all that good stuff. I want to show you these um, these parsley plants. So I've got three different parsley plants here. Boom, boom, boom. Basil, you get, you're not the star yet. Don't worry. You'll have your turn. <laughs> um, sorry. I'm trying to do it all on my desk. There isn't a ton of room. So it's, um, 
little bit of a shuffle here. So here are my three parsley plants. So this parsley plant, which you can kind of see is a little, it's seen better days, right? But I've literally been growing this parsley in my kitchen, I think since the beginning of February. And when I first bought it, it looked just like this guy right here. Um, so, you know, he's doing all right, but like I've been neglecting him a little bit lately. I went out of town for a little bit and he got really sad. It's been a while since I pruned him. So you can kind of see, so since it's been a while since I cut him back, you can kind of see how a lot of his new growth is really tiny. Um, and like a lot of this, it's got all the growth like near the base here is like kind of starting to die back because I haven't been trimming him enough. So this is kind of like a pretty standard example of what it looks like, what parsley looks like when it has not been trimmed enough. So this guy is in desperate need of a haircut. Um, and then this guy is like literally a parsley that I bought at the store today for $2.99. And he's, you know, it's, he, you can tell that this guy hasn't been pruned back in a while because these long guys are cotton really leggy. So when it's time for me to use some parsley, the first thing I'm going to do here, and I'm just going to do it because it's going to be so much happier once I do, um, you just want to kind of get these long guys out of the way. And then he'll start to shoot up these like little tiny leaves at the bottom. I don't know if you can see those guys. will start to kind of take over and these guys will start to get stronger. So... Boom. There you go. I just kind of, I've got some parsley to put on my dinner tonight and just like a little tiny bunch of parsley from that guy I just got at the store. Um, and then this parsley here, I bought this guy at the greenhouse a couple of weeks ago. And as you guys know, it, here in Tahoe, we've had some, we've had some weird weather in the last couple of weeks and we've been kind of trying to figure out, you know, I first I kind of had him in the shade of a tree, but it turned out that he was getting way too much sun. So you can kind of tell, especially like here, um, the the leaves have got got really scorched because I had him in too much sun and he started to look really sad. And so what I did is I moved him to a shady spot in the garden and he literally doubled in size in about a week. Um, so that just kind of goes to show like how, how, how well it responds to being in the right growing conditions. It went from like getting scorched leaves and being really sad. And like, I thought it was going to die to more than doubling in size. And this guy's kind of the same deal. I always just kind of try and go for the bigger kind of leafier, happier looking ones and kind of give the room to the smaller guys down below to kind of take over and become the strong part of the plant. Um, and you can kind of just take parsley as needed. You know, that's one of the great things about it is you just kind of, you just keep trimming it and you just kind of keep eating it. So there we go, there's, there's some parsley trimmings and you get to kind of see um, what's good and what's bad. So you have an idea of what you're going for. All right, parsley, you're gonna go away. And now we're gonna do my friend thyme. So I've got a several, a couple of different thyme plants. So here's one and here's two. <laughs> Sad looking, right? So this is a same deal. This is a guy that I bought today. Um, he's straight out of the bag, pretty happy, pretty lanky, you know, he's in need of a haircut. He's just going to be happier the more that we cut him. And this guy I have fully neglected, just so you know, like plant expert, I, I'm literally, I caretake hundreds and hundreds of plants. Sometimes they fall through the cracks. This guy fell through the crack. Um, I've been growing this guy on my kitchen counter since the beginning of February. And I kind of let him get shaded out and forgot about him um, by, by my basil. And one of the reasons I forgot about him was because of how absolutely, here, I'm just going to highlight her because she's so pretty oh look at that that is some time like come on it's it's amazing i just love it 
So I haven't really been needing my kitchen time because I have this giant, beautiful time plant um, for me. So this is what happens when it doesn't get enough sunlight, you haven't been trimming it, and it just kind of like I let it dry out a couple times. I just kind of really kept forgetting about it. So this is what it looks like when it's been sad and neglected. So you don't want to buy this guy at the grocery store. And um, I might be able to clean him up and put him outside and revive him. But time is so easy. You can kind of do it a couple of different ways. You can kind of go in and get the leafy stems and kind of be conscious, but it's of where you're cutting it. So it will branch out. Or you could, if you need like a lot of it, you know, when it's time, you can kind of just bunch it up and give it like a bit of a haircut, just like that. And his, he'll bounce back and be so happy. Um, and, you know, it's one of the things that you can tell if a plant really needs to be cut, especially an herb plant, is down here, like if the, if it starts to get like a little, I don't know if you can kind of see a little bit better like that. Um, if it starts to get like a little bit yellow down in there, that definitely is an indication that it needs a haircut. All right, well, let's talk about these basil plants. And then we've got some time for a few questions. So let's just try and get these basil out of the way here. So I've got two, two basil plants here. Um, one and two. So this guy that's like a little bit lanky, this guy is the guy that I bought at the store today, you know, and this is the same kind of plant that you would buy for five bucks at Trader Joe's or whatever. The plants that we're giving you are much smaller. Um, but you know, I think we've all bought this plant before. I mean, if you like herbs and growing plants, chances are you've had this basil plant in your kitchen and you're wondering why you can't keep it alive. <laughs> and this basil plant, I have been growing since, again, the beginning of February and he's been living in my kitchen. He recently got attacked by aphids and it caused some of this kind of curling of the leaves. So I'm, he's ready to kind of get a haircut and start to, um, grow new ones that aren't affected um, by the aphids anymore because I was managed to get rid of them. I think that there's a ladybug in here somewhere eating eating the remnants. So again, like the, the, the basil is like really easy to kind of see the nodes even more so than the oregano. So here we go. We've got this guy, one, two, three. So you want to keep at least three nodes on your basil plant, but everything above that third node is fair game. And I just kind of wanted to just show you on this one. So you can kind of tell I've been pruning this one properly because if you look at the stems, I'm trying to find the right, the best angle for this, like you can see where I harvested it before, at least I hope you can. I harvested, let me see if I, this one might be easier. It's a little closer. So you can kind of see like right there, maybe, maybe is this top right here is like where I clipped it. And look at this, it's got one, one, two, three, three new stems coming off of it pretty much. Like this one's a kind of a freak. He's like really going for it. So you can kind of see how it branches. There we go. There's, you can kind of see all the branches. It like, if you cut it in the right place, it just keeps branching and getting bushier and you just keep getting more basil. And as long as you keep doing this, like before it flowers, like you have really, really happy basil. So like all of these like little guys are fair game. Boom. Boom. You know, like I'm, I'm actually gonna cut these new guys off and see what happens. Boom. And I'm gonna leave that one little guy on this one. And like when you're trimming back your basil, you wanna try and like do it as evenly as possible, just so like, 
you have an even looking plant. Otherwise your plant will end up looking super lopsided. So boom, look at all this basil I have for dinner. I'm gonna have like quite the herb for dinner later tonight because this is a lot. And you can kind of tell, like, look at how different this guy is that I just bought at the store. He has not been properly pruned. His stems have gotten really like kind of thick and droopy. So like he is ready for a haircut. So same deal, like this guy, like you can kind of see how long, like this guy needed to be trimmed kind of like a little while back. And so since he, this basil leaf is like way down here, I know basil and basil, they're B-S-A-L and B-S-I-L, they're a little different. So I'm just gonna get just the very tippity tip of this guy off in hopes that it branches out because he actually, even though he's tall and big, doesn't have that many notes. So I'm gonna try and get him to be a little bit stronger and a little bit bushier, you know, and I might trim back just like a couple of these stems only because I think that there's too many stems coming out of this particular plant. And that's just kind of comes with learning a lot about plants. <laughs> um, I'm not going to trim too much of this guy now because I don't want to waste any more time because I want to leave a little bit of time for your questions. So that's just kind of like how you go through and prune all of these guys. Um, I can do a potting uh, demo too, but I feel like all of the rest of the workshops talked a lot about potting. So I wanted to kind of give you a little bit more of an overall of like how to do this. So there you have it, the four herbs, um, a little pruning and um, a little bit of knowledge about each one. Um, and do we have any questions? Yes, we do. So I can remove the demo spotlight and the first question for you is, when you say herbs love water, does that mean uh, to water more than once a day based on the finger test? Sometimes when it's hot, yeah. You know, like a lot of times in midsummer, you know, when we are in the 90s, you know, like I will water my plants twice a day, sometimes three times a day. Um, you know, I, I can kind of look at my plants and tell like the, you know, the basil is really the best indicator because as soon as he doesn't have enough water, like his leaves kind of go like this. And most plants kind of have that indicator where like all of a sudden there's just a little bit of wilt. It's like today it was hot enough that it was happening with my radishes outside. And so like about, um, I don't know, I want to say around two o'clock in the afternoon, I had to go out and give them a little bit of water, even though I watered them this morning, just because all of the leaves looked super wilty. So it's really like, depends on your drainage and how often you're watering them. But, you know, I often just kind of give them a little visual in the, in any plant that you grow, the more time that you spend with them, the more you get to know them, the more you get to understand them, the more you can kind of really pick up on some of those little signals of like, Hey, I need water. They tell you <laughs> they really do. Great question. And I want you to know, Heather, that every time you say time, Allison toy is chuckling in the chat <laughs> <laughs> time, time 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 um when you say grow parsley in shade of tomato plants does that mean you can plant in the same container as a tomato plant you most certainly can um you know the great thing about a lot of these herbs like tomato is like a little bit has a little bit of a deeper root system where pretty herbs mostly have a shallower root system so they're going to kind of stay on top of like or kind of like not necessarily share the same soil space as everything else, but it really depends on the size of your container. Like if you're doing it in like one gallon pots, like maybe not some room for parsley, but if you're growing it in like a big bed or, you know, a much bigger container, then you can definitely companion plant with your tomatoes. Great. Uh, have you had any success with cilantro? Or <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, 
No, not really. Um, I grow parsley because it's a thousand times easier. I've tried to start cilantro from seed. I've tried growing cilantro here um, with very minimum success. I've had a fair amount of success growing cilantro in my kitchen window, just because you can, again, like you can regulate it so much better if it's inside the house. Um, I feel like it just gets really spindly and it like turns yellow. And I've just, I think it likes it a lot hotter then we are able to grow here. Um, you know, there's a reason it does so well in Mexico um, and we just don't have those growing conditions here. And I don't love cilantro enough to really put in the effort to make it go. Like I'm pretty happy with parsley and, um, and the rest of my herbs. So unfortunately I don't have a lot of great advice for cilantro because I have failed many times trying to get it to go. And um, I would say if you really love cilantro and you need some, grow it in your kitchen and not outside. All right. Uh, do you repot grocery store herbs? Most of the time, yeah, because here, I'll actually kind of show you this oregano that I bought today that we just trimmed up, like check this guy out. I'm gonna try and not get dirt everywhere while I do this. Look at how root bound he is. So chances are your grocery store herbs have been neglected. Like there isn't some like, lovely person in the nursery, like really like taking great care of them. They're mass producing them to sell them cheap. So, you know, the, you're going to have to baby them when you get them home from the store. And like, even this guy, you know, like even just repotting him in something like this, like, I mean, I could do a repotting dump if I could pot this up. Like I actually have some soil right here if we wanted to do it, but like this guy, because he's a little root bound, you know, um, you're gonna to wanna to break them up a little bit. I'm trying not to get dirt everywhere on my desk and I'm failing. Um, just kind of, you know, give it a little bit of like a rough up on the bottom. Oh my God, so much dirt. Get out the vacuum. Um, you know, you kind of wanna break up that root ball a little bit cause that's just gonna give him a little bit more access to the nutrients in the water when it's all bound up like that. I mean, and that's like any plant when it, there there's a few plants that like to be like that but they're generally like the plants are unhappy if their roots are kind of circling around the pot they're looking for more nutrients they're looking for more soil so you want to kind of break them up a little bit you don't want to overdo it because you don't want to kill the plant but you just kind of want to get your fingers in there give it a little massage break it up a little bit and give, give them a little bit more dirt so like even this guy into this pot is going to be a lot happier than in this little guy with just a little bit more dirt and like, and you can, and as he grows, you can kind of keep repotting him and putting him in bigger and bigger stuff. So the answer is yes. Awesome. Which herbs tend to be perennials in Tahoe? Um, well, I, um, like I discussed thyme. I've definitely had a fair amount of success getting parsley to come back, but not always. And this is really like any perennial in Tahoe, like it always surprises me what comes back and what doesn't like some stuff that like, is just been tried and true for years on end. will all of a sudden, like all die one winter because of the, you know, our winters are so, they change so often. Like, you know, when we have big winters and there's like this big puffy layer of snow for all my plants to like hide under, like they are really happy. And I literally have a lot of success getting my plants to come back, but a winter like this past winter where it's like, not even snow on the ground the whole time. And like, it's, that's when your perennials really get hurt and it's kind of counterintuitive, but one of the keys to getting your perennials to come back, and this includes your herbs, but like any perennial is in, when it's really cold in the winter and there's no snow cover, your plants need water. If, if they have water around their roots, then when the water freezes, the, the temperature around those roots is 32 degrees. If your plants are dried out and they're exposed to the elements and suddenly it's like 20 degrees, suddenly the temperature around the roots of those plants is 20 degrees. Most plants can survive around 32 degrees as long as they stay 32 degrees, but a lot of perennials die below 32 degrees. Like rosemary cannot survive below 32 degrees. So like, it doesn't matter what you do to her, you cannot get her to come back up here. You know, maybe if you try and keep her alive and like dormant in the garage or you move her inside, 
I always give up and just buy a new rosemary plant. <laughs> That's kind of, I actually have growing some rosemary pretty successfully in my hydroponic garden right now. And I'm pretty happy about that. Um, but it's the key to getting your perennials to come back is to get that, keep them covered in snow and to actually make sure that they have water. If your perennials are drying out in between snowstorms, they're dead. And like, you have to kind of accept that. So, you know, especially stuff in pots, like you got to be on top of making sure that they have that water. It's kind of like, you want to think of the water, it's kind of like a 32 degree blanket for your plants. You know, as long as they have that 32 degree blanket, like they're going to be okay. But when they don't, that's when they die. That's All right. My- and uh, someone did ask, I think it's the next question. It's not. Someone asked to see your hydroponic system if you're <laughs> willing to, or can easily show it. Yeah, I, I guess I can do that. I, share. Um, I can just kind of, you can kind of see it here. Um, this system is called the Garden and it's like, a, I bought, it's kind of on the expensive side as far as hydroponic goes. I want to say I bought it early on um, right when they were kind of launching the company. And I want to say it was like 650 bucks for the unit, but you get, these are adjustable LED grow lights. It costs about $5 a month to run these grow lights. And then um, it's really pushy right now. I need to do a harvest. I've been so busy. I've been neglecting my hydroponic garden. I actually have seedlings I need to plant in here. It's a, I had a really bad aphid infestation because I went away and like it just, they just took over. So I'm like just coming back from that. Um, But it's got three towers. Um, It's kind of hard to see with the lighting because it's like bright with the lights, but it's got three towers. Um, And so it holds a total of 30 plants. Uh, So each tower holds 10 plants. I mean, I've been growing like this kale plant, you know, I've been growing and harvesting this guy for a couple months now. I've got a chard plant down here, same deal. Like, and I just like get it off whenever I want. I have some cucumbers growing down here. It just started blooming. Um, I have to bloom, I have to pollinate the blooms by hand. Um, and I haven't seen any baby cucumbers yet, but it's only been blooming for like a week. So fingers crossed. <laughs> um, I also have a tomato plant right here. This is a um, a cherry tomato plant and an indeterminate cherry tomato plant. Um, he's getting really big. <laughs> he's taking over. Um, like I said, the mint here is just out of control. Um, this, um, I actually wanted to kind of show this to you guys, like, because, you know, I was talking about parsley being in like the carrot and celery family. Oops. This guy is celery and you can see how much he looks like parsley. You know, he's, he's kind of not growing in the same bunch as he would like at the grocery store, but it's delicious. And I've been, you know, kind of trimming it. I've probably had four or five meals off of this guy. He's due for another. He's time to, you know, like it's, it's getting, (laughs) these plays are getting out of control. Um, I also have some peas growing up here. Um, try and get it to go back in. Um, peas. Yum. I, these guys never actually make it into the kitchen. I just eat them every morning when I wake up and I come and look at this thing. Um, yeah, here it is. And it's got a pump system. So it's a reservoir at the bottom. It holds six gallons of um, hydroponic solution. Um, and the, it just pumps it through the columns um, twice a day. And the thing that I really love about this is it's fully adjustable um, and, I, and I can control it all via an app. And there's actually you can pay extra and get this AI to kind of like help guide you through the process. And I did that for like the first year or so that I had it just so I could get a feel for it. And now I don't really need it anymore. Um, if you know what you're doing, you don't really need it. But if you don't know what you're doing, it's kind of great to spend the extra, I think it's like 20 or 30 bucks a month for the, the AI. And there's cameras built in and everything. Um, let me see if I can find it on here. Too many apps. Here it is. So like, here's the lighting thing. And I I don't know if you can kind of see that. Um, I can like turn the lights up and I can turn them down via boom. So it's really nice since it's in my living room, I can really adjust how bright it is. Um, And I can set the light schedule and there's a vacation mode. So like it slows the growth down for everything while I'm gone. It's pretty rad. And I don't buy any greens at the grocery store anymore. I, get, I grow all my own lettuce and kale and everything. So, and it's plenty for me. I give a, I give it away to my neighbor sometimes too, because it's too much. 
right? There's, there it is. It's pretty cool, huh? Thanks for showing us. That is the coolest thing ever. And, <laughs> uh, that's why we have you. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. If your basil has already been flowering, what is the best way to keep it producing? Just aggressively trim? aggressively trim it back but like once your basil starts flowering it's kind of like already like signaling that it's trying to make babies and 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 it's coming towards the end of its life cycle you can kind of draw it out a little bit by keeping but like the key is to try and trim it before it goes into its flowering state because if you can prevent it from flowering it'll continue to produce and be in a vegetative state which is like when it produces those really delicious great leaves um once it starts flowering it really starts to shift where it's putting its energy into. And it's really hard to convince it to stop doing that. Um, I mean, you can do it with some aggressive trimming and you'll squeeze a little bit more out of your basil, but you're, it's, it's, the plant has already kind of shifted its hormones and its ideas of, what it, of where in its life cycle it is. It's pretty hard to convince it to go back. For time growing on the ground after a while, when it gets woody inside a large clumped area, should I trim it all out for it to keep growing? Um, I get pretty aggressive trimming the woody backs, the woody stuff from my um, time back. I find that when I kind of get lazy about it and I don't do it, like it kind of tends to start like dying off and like looking kind of ratty and gross. So I get really aggressive in there trying to trim the woody bits back. And by trimming it back, like, you know, you want to leave some of it kind of like at the base and, but like the long leggy stuff that starts to cascade out, like that's the stuff you want to trim. Um, I don't know if we can get, if you can get a good look at my, my pride and joy right here. Um, if I can bring it closer. So if you can kind of get in here, you can kind of see that there is quite a bit of, I don't know, the picture quality isn't fantastic, but you can see all, like, this is about how long the woody stems are off of, that I trimmed it back to. You can kind of see it all in here, but you can kind of tell, like, there's some growth coming off, like, here's one. Like, see where the new growth is coming off of this? Like, I could even get in here and trim this a little bit more to get rid of that woody bit. So, like, essentially, you know, I trimmed it all back last winter and harvested it and dried it and use it. Um, and then, you know, this spring, when I started to see the new growth on it, I kind of trimmed it back even further. Cause like this woody mat was like, you come like cascade gating over the side here. I just love her. She's like a wig. I feel like I want to wear her on my head. Um, so like you really, the closer you kind of get those woody stems down, the bigger she's going to get. And like, and this is what you want. You want like all of these fresh, like green, like herby stems, like she's just so pretty. Like, and, and, you know, if I had left all that woody stuff that came like cascading over that was there at the end of last fall, she would be, she wouldn't be as lush. She wouldn't be as pretty. She'd be like kind of stringy and linky looking and not great. So be pretty aggressive, but you don't want to get all the way down because then the, the new growth won't have a place to sprout out of. There we go. Oh my God, there's dirt everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question. Do chives grow well in Tahoe? Uh, how to harvest them so that they continue growing? Chives grow great in Tahoe. I have, um, I almost brought my chives in here because I have this beautiful little bucket of chives out there and they're just are blooming. Um, they do the best, like they're like one of the first things to emerge in the spring. They really like cold weather. And um, I usually just kind of, be really kind of you know if you just kind of mow them down then <clears throat> what you can do you know it just takes a whole other growth session for it to come back which is like you know four to six weeks at least um if it's happy so when i harvest it i kind of go through and kind of selectively pick stuff so it's like here and there so it doesn't look like somebody came down and like mowed it and one of the things that I love about chives is that the, I think that the blossoms are just as delicious and so, and, and so beautiful that you can eat the blossoms. So like I often 
wait for the blossoms to come because I love how beautiful they are. And I love breaking them up and putting them in salads and, um, and cooking with them because they're just such a beautiful garnish and they taste good. Um, I think that it's actually kind of almost a more subtle oniony flavor. So it's so pretty in like a potato salad or like a pasta salad to just like have these like little purple blossoms all in there that taste like all oniony. So I'm like kind of selective with the stems and like I try and like make it look like I didn't cut a ton of it out even though maybe I did you know like the number one thing is you don't want to like I used to I used to watch this herb garden that I at this restaurant that I worked at and the chefs would always come out and just like mow down the chives and I would be like because <gasps> it, it was like it was so hard to get them to come back um you know and usually like when I, I really like the blossoms so I usually harvest the blossoms before they really open up and like start to like seed out. Um, I usually leave a couple because this year I'm so excited. Like I did that last year and there's like a whole bunch of like new little chives kind of coming out like on the edge of my bucket of chives. So, you know, just, I like to kind of harvest it as it goes and then it just kind of keeps producing. Um, and they kind of, the stems of the flowers kind of get like a little thick and like woody. So I, when, the, the flowers start to die back, I really make sure I get in there and get all of the flower stems out because that'll kind of keep it growing, getting it to kind of like regenerate and kind of create more chives. And like they lose my chives usually bounce back like pretty hard in the fall, like when it gets cold again, they're kind of like parsley is in like, they really like it kind of cool. They like it kind of earlier on. And, um, but they're great because you can just harvest them all the time. They are tough to get started. Like if you've ever tried to start chives from seed, like it's really hard. Um, or if like you have like a little baby chive plant and you plant it and then like nothing really happens, like two or three years, it's going to be huge and it's going to be happy and you're going to have more chives than you know what to do with. So like you kind of chives, you kind of need to be patient. Great. Next question. We have three questions left. Beyond these four herbs, what other herbs do you recommend for Tahoe? Sounds like chives, yes. Cilantro, no. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I grow a lot of different kinds of mint. Um, one of my favorite herbs, which a lot of people don't even consider an herb, which she's on the backside of here, are my violas. Um, you know, like the little Johnny Jump Up violas. I use them as an herb and I use them all the time. Like you can harvest these flowers and you can make um, violet syrup. And it's like magic. I really want to do a video where I talk about violets and I make violet syrup, syrup because it's like, it's, if you have the time, research it on YouTube. There are some great videos out there that other people have made. It is seriously like doing a magic trick and it feels so beautiful. And you make the most beautiful drinks and you can like have it on pancakes and all kinds of stuff. It's just like this beautiful magenta um, syrup that you can make from the violets. And you can freeze them in ice cubes, like if you like cocktail culture, like having violets in your garden is great. Um, <clears throat> so like, I think that's actually one of my favorite herbs in like the, oftentimes they're supposedly an annual, but most years I get them to come back. Um, and they're very vigorous in the spring. And as long as you keep deadheading them, even though they get a little linky, they will last all summer long. Uh, and I'm trying to think time, which as I, I talked about is definitely my favorite. Um, and I use it for landscaping, I use it for accents, I use it for culinary. It is just like I think I I think I talked about how much my favorite. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I grow quite extensively. Um, I've had the, I've had hit and miss um, with tarragon. Like I always I, I love tarragon, so I always plant it and try and get it to go. And sometimes it goes, and it's super happy. And I have loads of tarragon, and I've had summers where like I've just really failed, and like nothing's happened. Um, sometimes I grow sage, but like so much great wild sage grows everywhere. I literally just find a spot to go and harvest it from the wild. And actually, the harvest uh, right now, um, you know, I don't. I don't, it's foraging is a whole nother subject and I don't know how much I want to like get into it, but, um, I do have my secret spots. Um, and right now is actually a great time to harvest stage. Uh, it's just starting to get its new growth and you want to try and harvest that before it flowers. Um, I do harvest it when it flowers and like use it for making kind of like herbal, um, 
you know, presents for people. I do like a lot of smudge sticks, you know, which is like dried sage with like other flowers and you like burn it and it's like cleansing for your home. It's like an incense. And I like to give that away as presents. So, um, you know, I can, you can definitely use that with the flowering, but you, it's the same as the, any other herb. It, it's the most potent, it's the most useful right before it flowers, like when it's growing and it's strong and it has all that fresh growth and right before it flowers. Because essentially what it does is it takes all the energy that's in its leaves and it puts it into the flower and you're, you're trying to get the essence out of the leaves. So like if it's gone and put it into the flower, then it's lost a lot of that essence in the leaves and, it's, and you're losing a lot of those great properties that you're trying to get out of the plant. Um, that's all I can think of at the top of my head. <laughs> well, you kind of started to answer the next question a little bit, uh, talking about sage, but do I see wild thyme growing along the trails when I hike in the area? Are there any other wild or indigenous herbs? There's loads of wild and indigenous herbs that you can use. Um, you know, it's a little dangerous to just be like, oh, like, go ahead and use this because, um, you gotta be really careful because it, you know, there's lots of stuff. You gotta know what you're doing. Like you gotta have like a really strong background in botany, um, and really be able to understand like the subtle differences in some of these plants. Cause some of them are really poisonous if you get the wrong one. And a lot of them look alike. Um, but some of the, uh, herbs that I use pretty extensively, um, that come from the wild are definitely sage and, um, there are some wild arnicas out there, but those are like really sensitive and like really, you don't want to necessarily harvest those. Um, there's lots of coyote mint and there's horse mint. Um, and I have a couple of patches um, in my secret spots that I go. And whenever you're doing any kind of wild foraging, I will say that the most important thing is that you are in a place where it's legal for you to harvest it. So you want to read up on what it, where it is that you are and, you know, a lot of the places I harvest from are like friends properties because it's private property and I have permission to be able to harvest there. Like if you, you know, the it's murky in our national forest and like a lot of these preserved areas, like you're not allowed to harvest. So um, you want to make sure that it's legal for you to harvest there. And you also want to make sure that whatever you're harvesting, you're doing it in a sustainable fashion. If it needs to be growing in enough abundance that when you go to harvest it, you have as much as you need and it doesn't even look like you were there. And you do that by kind of really selectively taking bits and pieces here and there. Um, and, you, and really a huge part of foraging is really only taking what you need. I think as humans, like we really just want to like gather all the things and be like, oh, I have all the things. But like when it comes to herbs, like you don't need a ton, especially if you're just using it to, for personal use. Like it's very minimal. Like it takes me a really long time to go through a jar of oregano. Um, you know, and I use it in a lot of things, you know, so you really want to be super conscious of how much you're taking and how you're taking it and where you're taking it from. Um, and, you know, I, th this is like a whole nother class. It just, there's so many useful herbs and medicinal things that come from our, um, come from our natural environment. It's, it's like, a, I could talk about it for another hour and two hours. <laughs> so Maybe that's another class. I don't know. <laughs> we'll put it on the, we'll pencil um, it into the books. Yeah. Um, do you find your clay pots dry out faster? What do pots you. do you like best for herbs? Um, you know, I, I'm a total pot, um, you know, user and finder. And I, terracotta is great because it's cheap. Um, I don't really find that it dries out faster. Um, you know, and like the nice thing about the clay pot too, is if you get the, if you get them wet enough, um, the clay pot actually kind of helps give it water back because it's holding water too. Um, the biggest thing when you're choosing a pot is just make sure there's a drainage hole in it. If you're buying a pot and it doesn't have a drainage hole, just put it back because you don't need it because it's going to kill your plant. Um, I just hate that there's so many pots out there that don't have drainage holes. If you are just dying for a pot and it doesn't have drainage holes, use like one of these inside of it and like use the pot as like a saucer. Um, like you really have no business putting a plant in a pot that doesn't have a drainage hole because you're not doing yourself or your plants like any favors. And it's probably my big, one of my biggest pet peeves as a plant person is like, stop making these pots without drainage holes the plant people are mad. Um, 
Yeah. So, I mean, I, I use a ton of terracotta. I love terracotta. Um, my new favorite pots are actually kind of pots like these. They're kind of, um, they're like an acrylic kind of poly blend pot that I buy at the grocery. Like, I think I bought mums in this for like $10, like four years ago. It's light. It's got a drainage hole. I can move it around. It looks like a beautiful, heavy glazed pot, but it's not. Um, and it was a fraction of the price. And like, when I have to move it around, it can, it's not like I, you know, like I love, I have a handful of like really beautiful ceramic pots that are glazed and I love them. They are gorgeous, but like, I need to call a friend over to help me move them because they weigh 10,000 pounds. So these are probably, I, I love these, like whenever I can find them, like sometimes like I will buy the plant that's in them, even though I don't want them because I want the pots because <laughs> pots are expensive. You know, and I do a lot of container gardening because I move around a lot and, you know, I have hundreds of plants and pots. Um, so I really find that I, I go for like aesthetics too, like design and kind of aesthetically beautiful things, especially in my garden are very important to me. So I really don't love just kind of having stuff like out like this. Like I want it to be like in something pretty <laughs> because I think this is so much more pleasant than this. Um, so that's kind of really what drives my idea of what is great for a pot um, and kind of choosing pots. Like I try and, you know, I do terracotta and I do um, aluminum pots and I do kind of like these bluish types of pots and like, that's it. Like I try not to, and, and some wine barrels. I don't try and do like a million different kinds of pots because I think it looks messy. And, and I think that, you know, I'm always trying to create a co cohesive, theme and idea within my garden and to make it beautiful and feel like a relaxing place. I feel like when we're kind of in our gardens, like we forget how important aesthetics is, you know, um, it's kind of one of the things I do with my business is I try and get people to understand that like the design of your garden and the idea of like how your plants look and how you feel when you are in your garden is equally as important. Uh, because if, if it looks like chaos, it probably feels like chaos and it's not going to be a relaxing place. So in choosing your pots, pick a theme, pick a color, pick an idea, and suddenly your, your yard and your garden will be transformed because it will feel so much more relaxing and it'll be so much more beautiful. There we All go. right, actual last question. Do you put <laughs> oregano in the same pot as tomatoes? I never have. I mean, in my research, everything I read said oregano is a great com companion plant for tomatoes. Um, I think that the biggest um, thing that I would warn about <clears throat> that is oregano is a mint and it tends to kind of take over as a mint. Um, and if you're doing really well, I would be, I'll be a little bit worried that your oregano might be stealing from your tomatoes. Um, but with that being said, like the oregano plants that we're giving you guys are kind of tiny. So I think if you kind of put those guys down, like it, there isn't enough growing season for them to really take over and really hurt your plants <laughs> and they probably just help them. So, um, you know, I think that's one of the fun things about gardening. You read some stuff and you're like, oh, like maybe I'll try that. And, um, and you try it. And sometimes you're like, yeah, oh my God, that's amazing. I'm doing that every year. Like that worked out so well. And sometimes it's like a big kind of like, wah, wah, you know, and it's so funny because our, our growing seasons and the way our seasons go like really differ so much. It's one of the things that's so challenging about growing up here is that, you know, one time, one year, something works really well. And then the next year it doesn't. And you're constantly kind of playing with it and trying to figure out like what's going to do well this season. And it, and it always surprises me um, what does well and what doesn't and, you know, what's coming back and what doesn't it's uh it's, it's a bit of a, it's, you know, it's makes, leaves things exciting for us gardeners up here in Tahoe. Like it's never the same thing twice. It doesn't get boring. That's for sure. Mother nature's always throwing us curveballs and trying to get us to figure out different things and different ideas <laughs> to make it go. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Heather. I'm going to stop sharing my screen just for a second so that I can pull up our slides to wrap up this evening. So if you all have any further questions that you want to ask Heather, um, you can reach her. Um, she has two email addresses. Um, 
heather.kennison at gmail.com and then gaiasoulhome at gmail.com. Or if you're interested in receiving any um, consultation or work from Heather, her personal company is Tahoe Integrated Landscape Consulting, and that is the email address for her company. And if you are interested in rewatching any of the workshops that have taken place this spring. We had seven workshops in our series, Organic Gardening with Heather. Um, and then we worked through uh, potatoes, kale, lettuce, chard, strawberries, herbs, tomatoes, beans, and peas. And I might be missing one, but they're all online for you to watch. <laughs> so so um, you can access the drops off. Can I interject? Because I want to say before everybody leaves that. There has been one common factor in these last two years of workshops, and it's been Anne Graham. And this is actually the last workshop that she is scheduled to host. So, and she has done an absolutely amazing job, just so well-spoken, so poised, and so well-organized. And I know I speak for everybody in our gardening group that we really cannot imagine doing these workshops without you. So uh, if everybody wants to take a moment and put in some words of Aww. praise and appreciation for Anne in the chat, she deserves it. She's amazing and yay. Oh, thanks Anne, yeah. you're awesome. <laughs> hey, you guys, I actually have, I have one more screen. Um, Do you uh, wanna share a slide? Yeah, I have a couple more slides I totally forgot about. Okay. <laughs> They're Let really me let me just quickly share um, some of the information and then I'll go okay. back or maybe it makes more sense. I was going to share. Okay. Let me stop sharing and then I'll let you uh, share the rest of your presentation. Sorry about that friends. No problem. Um, is it going? No. Um, I don't see your slides yet. There we go. There you go. So um, just a couple more. If you want to follow me on social media, I have four social media accounts. My personal one, Facebook is at Heather Adams. Um, my Facebook for my um, for my business is Tahoe.integrated landscaping. Instagram's at Gaia Soul Home. And my other Instagram, Tahoe.integrated landscaping as well at um, Instagram. I I share all kinds of fun plant and gardening stuff. I do videos all the time. Um, I do like little helpful hints. And I'm also a very avid sailor. So there's lots of really fun sailing content on there as well. And I have a fabulous dog. So if you like dog photos too, there's always some of those on there. So if you want some uh, fun gardening Tahoe information, sailing slash dog information, please follow me on social media. And I'm going to have all kinds of fun promotions and stuff coming up. So thank you. Awesome. And that's me, Tahoe Integrated Landscaping. If you want to get a hold of me as well, visit my website. And um, you can message me directly from my website. If you want to book an appointment, you can go on there and book an appointment and then we we'll do a little free consultation with you. And then um, we can set up a time for me to come over. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. This has been really fun. I really appreciate it. And Anne, you're a gem. And I don't know how we're going to do this without you. We might not be able to. <laughs> well, shameless <laughs> plug. If anyone has a job. <laughs> I'm an AmeriCorps member with Turk. So my, my time is, uh, is a finite service term. So that is why I will not be continuing with the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center. Um, though I wish I could, but as Heather mentioned, um, there are a number of different organizations that have gone into uh, putting our workshop series together this spring. And I just wanted to highlight, since we don't have other workshops to highlight in our series, um, some of the great work that these different organizations have going on uh, to highlight Slow Food Lake Tahoe first. Um, they have a number of different volunteer opportunities. You can participate in Harvest Mondays or Work Wednesdays with them, and they have information on their website link there. And actually, I uh, created a list to send to everyone of both if you're still interested in reserving herbs, that top link in what I just put in the chat is the link for um, reserving herbs through our um, donation and pickup opportunity. But 
I've also linked some websites um, for our various organizations. Um, but Slow Food Lake Tahoe also is the sponsor of the Trekkie Saturday Farmers Market um, that is now at the historic downtown rail yard parking lot in Trekkie, as well as the, uh, that's a time when you can bring uh, your compost to them and they actually collect compost for their garden. And they also sell compost bins for $10. And those uh, on the right side of our slide here, you can see their social media pages. Then the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center, we just reopened our Science Center today, which is located in Incline Village, Nevada. We are open for tours by reservation. And in Incline Village, we have the North Tahoe Demonstration Garden, as well as then in Tahoe City, we have the Tahoe City Demonstration Garden, which is a native plant garden. We would love to have you all come out for a tour. You might get a tour uh, given by myself or our lettuce, kale, and chard presenter, Allison Toy, um, who also works with Turk. Uh, I love it. I love Turk, a great organization. Then we also have worked with the UCCE Master Gardeners of Lake Tahoe. They put on Master Gardener trainings and have a variety of different really dedicated um, individuals and knowledgeable people around the basin. Many of our presenters, including Heather, Dave Long, um, Melissa, and I think those are Allison's most of our presenters were master gardeners so another great organization they're working together I believe to put together uh, to plan a master gardener training but they are in a transition period to a new manager um, so check their website for more information about that and then the Tahoe Heritage Foundation and the Talak Historic Site and the Demonstration Garden they have there uh, also have volunteer opportunities at their website. You can find an application to become a docent or in, get involved in working in their garden in a number of different ways. Um, you can see here, there's so many different ways that you can get involved with them, but it does include being able to work and help out in their demonstration garden. And then lastly, as Heather highlighted, um, she has started her Tahoe Integrated Landscape Consulting Services. And she is, as you all know, from participating in this workshop tonight, such a knowledgeable resource and your garden could not go wrong without or with cons consultation from her. But uh, thanks, Anne. <laughs> our herb pickup is this weekend. Um, not Saturday, June 15th. Today is June 15th. It's the 19th. Um, and <laughs> that was a funny typo on my part, but same three pickup locations in South Lake Tahoe, um, in the parking lot of the big five or Verde Mexican rotisserie, uh, in Trekkie at the food bank garden or in Tahoe city at the Tahoe city demonstration garden, same place as the Tahoe city field station for UC Davis Turk. And if you are still interested in, uh, reserving herbs, that link is in the chat, but thank you all so much for all of your participation. If you are a repeat participant of all of our workshops, it was great to have you. If you just learned about herbs tonight, it was also great to have you. So um, thank you all so much and stay tuned for whatever workshops we will have planned next. Raven, I'm fully aware of her presence. Thanks everybody. All right. Good job, Anne. Thank you. I love your presentations. Oh, thank you. And also super fun to learn about herbs. So, <laughs> thank you so much for presenting. I was, I was a little nervous since I've never taught it before, but it <laughs> well. I mean, I, I love it so much. I know it, go, it just comes out. <laughs>